Welcome to uh, Intro to GPG and Web of Trust. You can get to it. So like I said, my name's Doug. I'm not going to mention my last name either. I think I'll butcher it too. Um, <laughs> so I'm a software developer at Rackspace, and I work on cloud security products. And so what that means is I get to work with some really talented security folks. And uh, I get to learn some cool stuff. They also make me really paranoid. And so that's sort of where I got interested in GPG and, and sort of what, what all they can do for us. So um, given that this is a, a crypto track talk, I figured we'd introduce the usual players. And so this is all Alice and Bob. And so Alice wants to be able to talk to Bob over an insecure channel, right? And some of the things that, that they're going to be worried about is, is I don't want eavesdropper. So I like if I'm Alice, I don't want anybody to listen to sort of the things that I want to talk to Bob about. Uh, so I want to make sure that, that when I send a message to Bob, only Bob can read it. I also want to make sure that, that you know, if I was Bob receiving this message, I want to make sure that, that the, the message is really coming from Alice and it's not you know, some other person pretending to be Alice. Uh, and I also want to be pretty sure that the message hasn't been changed in transit, right? Like maybe Alice tried to set something, somebody intercepted it in the middle of the way, changed up the message, and then gave it to me, right? So these are sort of the, the things that I'm concerned about when, when trying to talk to somebody else. And so what Bob and Alice can do is uh, use GPG because GPG provides a lot of really cool features that can sort of help us secure these insecure communication channels. And so one of the, one of the things that GPG can provide is confidentiality, right? And so these fix speaks to that concern about preventing third parties from reading your communications. And so what GPG can guarantee is that anybody who only the people who have access to the right keys are able to read the messages, right? And so pretty much like anything in encryption, the, keys, uh, the security is gonna come down to how secure you can keep your keys. And so if you keep your keys pretty secure, it'll provide kind of confidentiality for you. It'll also provide uh, integrity. And so with GPG, we can sort of have that assurance that a message has not been tampered with in transit. And then it also provide uh, non-repudiation, which I couldn't find a good picture for that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it basically means that once somebody's written a message, they can't deny having written it. And so you can sort of relate this to like signing a contract in the real world. If you sign a contract with somebody later on, you can't go back and say, well, no, I, I, that wasn't really me. This has got your signature on it. So, so GPG sort of provides us that concept of of having a signature as well that you can't repudiate. Um, also interesting is you know saying saying okay well if, if sort of the contrary is true too that you can you can't produce a message and claim that I've signed it or that I've sent it without my signature. So there's that. And so once we think about all those three things together, then we can sort of have this assurance that a message is authentic, right? I know that nobody else has read it except for the people that are intended to read it. I can make sure that it hasn't been tampered with, and the, I can be sure that the person claiming to send it really, really is who they who they claim to be, right? Uh, and I can do that with GPG because it all uses encryption under the hood, right? And so I'm gonna just do a quick little crypto 101 so we're all on the on the same playing field here. Uh, and so the first thing I want to talk about as far as crypto primitives is gonna be hashing. And so hashing, I'm a developer, right? I like to think of this as just some function. I don't care about the implementation. Uh, but I basically give it some input. It gives me some output. The input we're going to call the plain text or the message. And the output is going to be the digest. And so what's interesting about hashing is that given the same input, it'll always produce that same digest, right? And then uh, the digest is always going to be the same size. So if, if whether you, know, you give me a, a huge email, a huge file, uh, or just a little bit of text, the size of the digest is always going to be the same. And one of the interesting features of cryptographically secure hashes is that even just a little bit of a change in the message will cause a completely different digest, right? And so for example here, we're using uh, SHA-256 as the encryption, or sorry, as the hashing algorithm here. And if I was to hash this message, attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, you can see the hash that this would produce. If I change just one character on that, you can see that the hash is completely different, right? So this is one of the tools we're going to use in GPG to sort of guarantee that a message hasn't been tampered with, right? We'll, we'll be able to compute the hash of a message and then 
um, if the hash is different what, than what we expect, we'll know that that it's been tampered with. If it's the same, we'll know it's, it's good. Uh, another form of encryption used in GPG is symmetric encryption. And um, the idea here is that basically there's, there's two functions, right? The encryption and the decryption function. And they both work with the same key. And that's what makes it a symmetric encryption thing is that it's the very same key used for encryption, used for decryption. You know, give it a plain text and the key, it gives you the, the encrypted ciphertext. The key and the encrypted ciphertext then with decryption gives you back the original message. So this is useful when, you know, you have to encrypt something for a lot of people. You sort of give all the people that same key and then everybody can decrypt this thing. Sort of another um, encryption scheme that GPG uses is asymmetric encryption. And so the interesting part here about asymmetric encryption is that you have a key pair. So these are two different keys that are sort of related to each other, right? They have a special relationship. And because of that, they're able to do some pretty neat stuff. Like whatever you encrypt with one key, you can only decrypt with the other. It doesn't matter which key you use. You know, if you encrypt it with one, only the other one can decrypt it. And sort of the, the inverse of that is true, right? Like if I'm able to decrypt something with one key, then I know for sure the other key was used to encrypt it. That's basically the idea behind public key encryption, right? Except that here we're, we're taking those two pieces of this key and assigning a role to each one. So one of them is going to be our public key. And we're going to publish this, just give it out to people, attach it to your email, put it on business cards, whatever. Public key can go to everybody. And then I'm going to keep that other half of the key, that corresponding key pair. I'm going to keep that private. And so then what I can do is that anybody who's got a public key can encrypt things that only I can decrypt because I'm the only one who's got the private key. Now I mentioned earlier, and then I'll mention it again a couple times throughout the presentation, like it's really important that you keep those keys secure, right? Especially, you know, anybody who gets a hold of my private key can effectively pretend to be me. So important that we keep these safe. Um, also interesting is that anything that I encrypt with my private key, anybody else can decrypt who's got access to my public key, right? And so that might not seem, you know, interesting at first. It's like, well, why would I want to encrypt something that anybody can decrypt? But the implication here is that the only person that could have encrypted it is me because I'm the only one who's got the private key. Everybody with me so far? If you've got questions, by the way, just raise your hand or yell at me. And so once we start combining these things, we can make some really interesting stuff, right? And so if you think about hashing and then um, asymmetric encryption, and we use those together, we can arrive at this concept of digital signatures. So basically, the, the way a digital signature works, this is how we would make one, how I would sign a document. So I take the document and I calculate a hash. Remember, the hash is just going to be that, that small, unique number that's going to be different for every message. And then I take my private key, which only I have. And when I take that, that digest, that hash I calculated, I'm going to encrypt it with my private key. And then that effectively becomes my digital signature. And then I can attach that to my message I want to send out and send it out to everyone. And on the other side, whenever somebody receives that, what they can do is they can take that. This is an important step, right? They can take the message and calculate a hash themselves of the message they received. Now, remember we talked about hashing. If you hash the same message, you'll end up at the same hash or at the same digest. So first, I, I take that message I received, calculate my own hash of what I received. Then I take that digital signature, and I use the public key of the person that sent it to me to decrypt it. Now, remember, because I'm using the public key, the only thing that could have been used to encrypt that is the private key, the corresponding private key. And then what that will give me is the digest that the person who wrote the message arrived at. And what I can do then is take that message that I decrypted and the message I, or the digest I calculated myself and I compare the two. And if the two are the same, then the implication of that is that the message has not been changed, right? Not only has it not been changed, but the person who wrote it is also in, in possession of the private key that matches that public key. Everybody with me so far? Awesome. And so the important part here, obviously, is the key. Sort of the, the operations, we don't need to get into the details so that, like the GPG tool, will be able to manage that for us. Um, but the key management uh, is, is a pretty important part of G 
GPG, one of the sort of the complaints about it is that it, it makes me, maybe makes you manage too many keys, right? So if we go back to think about Alice and Bob, well, if I'm Alice, I'm going to have, you know, obviously my private key that I'm keeping secret, and I've got my public key too. And then I want to send a message to Bob, and I want to send this in, as, as an encrypted message, right? And so for this to work, I'm going to need Bob's public key, right? I'm going to need their public key so that I can encrypt something so that only they can decrypt it because only they have the matching private key. Um, but if I also want to talk to Carlos, in addition to Bob, I'm going to need Carlos's public key too. As a matter of fact, I'm going to need the public key for every single person that I want to communicate with via GPG. And so you can sort of think of GPG as, as the key management aspect of it as like a, like a big contact list or a Rolodex or something like that. where you're constantly keeping these public keys from people that you're communicating with. And uh, there's a couple of ways that you can get those. You know, they can send them to you directly. There's a couple of uh, file servers, public file servers, where people upload their public keys. And so if we talk about GPG keys and, the, and sort of the way that we're going to think about them, um, so they're going to be stored locally in some database. And then GPG, I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about the command line tool because I'm a developer and, and I like the command line. But there is some uh, nice user interfaces for this if, if you're not comfortable with the, with the command line. So one of the options I have here is to list all the keys. And this is going to show me basically every one of my contacts for which I've acquired the public key. I'm also, um, it's also going to keep track of my private key or many private keys. Some people choose to have more than one. Um, maybe you have a project or something like that that you want to dedicate a key to. So those are all going to be listed there. Also, the key, your private keys are going to be protected by passphrase. Now, it's important that you make this uh, really hard to guess because in the event that somebody gets a hold of your private key, the file, now remember, the private key is still going to be a file on this. Um, somebody gets a hold of that, the only thing that's going to prevent them from using it is going to be this passphrase, right? Every time you use your key, you have to punch in this right scheme, passphrase. Um, keys also have a unique fingerprint. It's a really long number. And uh, this is how you can sort of coordinate with people to make sure that you're talking about the same key. This, this fingerprint is going to be unique for everybody who's using GPG, right? Um, and there's also um, what a lot of people call a key ID, which is the last eight digits of the fingerprint. Now, this is sort of a, a shorthand kind of way of doing stuff locally. Um, it can be dangerous, though, because it, 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 there's some attack that you can actually fake this key ID. And so when you're talking about you know, exchanging or verifying keys, you want to make sure that you use that full fingerprint. Um, the GPG key itself is actually going to consist of a whole lot of cryptography keys. We don't really need to dive down into what the keys actually are and stuff like that, unless you want to. Uh, but basically, when I talk about you know, your GPG key, it's actually a collection of a bunch of different keys. There's a key pair that's used for signing. There's a separate key pair that's used for encryption. Uh, you can actually. Out of, out of the box, you'll get two keys, but signing and encryption, but you can also add other sub keys if maybe you want a different key for encryption depending on the email address that you want to use or whatever. And one last thing that, that your GPG is going to have attached to it is uh, a user ID or UID. And this is basically going to be a legal name that you want to use. Uh, this will be you know usually your given name, so my, my key will have my legal name on there. Comment, which is just whatever it, it, you can think of to help people identify your key or identify you as you. Uh, and then some email address. And this is how it's going to sort of tie into your email system and stuff like that. Is you'll be able to identify these keys by the email address that's attached to them. We naturally, um, if we list out the fingerprint here, you see uh, I'm referring to a key ID for my own key. Um, and this is the fingerprint right here. And so if I was to, to want to communicate with one of you guys, I would give you my entire key fingerprint. And then it would be your responsibility to, when you download the key, verify that those fingerprints match. You can also see here, this is showing me my public key. Uh, if, you were, if we were looking at a private key here, it would say SEC. Um, these are all options of, of what the different actual like cryptography keys underneath are. 
you can see here I've got my master key up here, two sub keys down here, and I'll get into sort of what this means here in a little bit. Uh, and actually have like four user IDs on my key. I've got four different email addresses that I use. Um, and so I use the same key for every single one. A lot of people like to use separate keys for different email addresses. It's really up to you on, on your comfort level with reusing the key. So the first thing you're going to want to do, well, first you're going to want to install GPG. And so most Linux distributions have that out of the box. Uh, for Mac, there's a project called GPG Tools that you can download and install. And it'll come with the command line client as well as the, the email plugin. Uh, for Linux, for email, you can use um, Thunderbird with a plugin called Enigma Mail. These are all plug into to the command line system and the database and all that. That's all shared. Uh, and so usually, like when people get excited about GPG and want to go try, and this is what happened to me. Like I'll go, yeah, I'm gonna go make my key, and then it starts asking you questions, and then you don't really know what's going on. And so the first thing that it asks you is like, what kind of key do you want? Now this relates to the the actual crypto keys underneath. There's a whole of different options. I'm not going to get into the details. I'm just going to recommend that everybody do RSA and RSA. In newer versions of GPG, this is the default. You've got a little bit older build. You've got to make sure that, that you're choosing the option to have RSA and RSA. This is going to be for the master key and the sub key. But um, DSA, you don't really want to. Eh, it's, it's, the key space is too small nowadays to be re really recommended. So. If you want a key that's going to last you a good five, 10 years, my recommendation is pick RSA, RSA. Next thing it's going to ask you is for a, for a key length. Basically, uh, the idea here is that the more bits you have, the harder it would be for somebody to guess the key. Now, also, there's the trade-off of um, efficiency there. So if you pick like the, the absolute highest bit, key possible, and that's going to make it difficult for people who have to verify. Like, they'll have to do more work. If they have an older computer, it might take a while. It's a trade-off. My recommendation would be to do uh, 4096. As you can see, the default is 2048, which is currently considered secure, but I want my key to last, you know, a good 5, 10 years. So bump that up, 4096, that would be my recommendation. It'll ask you then about uh, expiration. It would be a good idea to set your key to expire. If you don't really know whether you want it to expire or not, you can set this to zero or, or set it to not expire. You can always change this later, so don't you know? Don't think about it too much. Like, ah, do I really want it to expire? Is it gonna be? You know, is it gonna last a while? It doesn't matter. You can change it later, and you can always make a new key later on. After that, it's gonna ask you for um, generating this user ID. It's gonna ask you for your real name. Now, um, I recommend you actually use your real name because um, it won't. It, it'll help people that want to communicate with you that can't get a hold of you right away. Um, ask for your email address and then a comment, just a helpful comment to help people find you. And then it'll, you know, summarize the the user ID in that format that I talked about earlier. Once you say okay, then it's going to ask you for your passphrase. And this is going to be real important that you know you think of a good passphrase. Also, the safest place for this is in your head. Like, don't write it down on a piece of paper next to the thumb drive that has your key. That that'd be bad. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, if somebody was able to compromise that key database that includes your private key, the only thing that's going to prevent them from using it is going to be uh, this passphrase. And so at the end of that, we'll, we, you know, we can print out the fingerprint, and this is what we would, we would have. It's considerably smaller than mine, because this is a brand new one. Uh, as you can see here, we're looking at a public key. 4096 here is going to be the bit length of the key. So here we can, we can sort of verify that it did make the correct size. The R there is going to be for RSA. So whenever you check on your key, just make sure that R is there for RSA. Uh, fingerprint. So this fingerprint is going to correspond to your master key, and it's actually going to be the same no matter, like whether you add sub keys or remove them or expire them over time. This fingerprint's never going to change. So this is the thing that you can get, you know, tattooed on your arm to give to people and stuff like that. Um, then, you, as we can see here, I've also got a sub key. Like I mentioned earlier, the master key is used for signing. Sub key is for encryption. Sub key is also 4096. Also RSA, and this is. Um, the fingerprint of the subkey, we don't really use this much for anything. 
that I'm aware of anyway. <laughs> Um, and then one more thing, one sort of more security feature you can do is create a revocation certificate and put this in a nice place. Uh, a revocation certificate basically tells people like this key is no longer valid. And the reason you might want to generate this up front and then just keep it in a safe place is that in the event that your laptop, that, that was the only laptop that had your key or something like that blows up, uh, then your revocation certificate, if you have, a, if you have one already created and stored will serve to tell people like, hey, this key is no good anymore. I've actually got a buddy who had two really nice keys that he'd gotten signed by a bunch of people and stuff like that. And then his, he wiped his hard drive because he thought he had backed them up and he had not. So his keys are gone forever. And they still look like valid keys because he never made a, a revocation certificate for those. So this is important to have, not necessary, just a little extra security measure in, in the event that you lose your key. Yes. So to, would you be able to recreate the key with your passphrase? No, no. The passphrase is, is really there just to unlock the key. Yeah. So then also, so now that we have a key, we're going to want to share it. One way to share it is to export the key. And here, export is, is only going to export the public key, right? This is not, not going to share my secret key with anybody. There is an export secret keys command if you want to back it up. Back, back up the secret one, that is. Um, armor here is just telling it I want to use uh, ASCII armor, so it's just going to look like plain text on the file. And then I give it my key ID that I want to back up. And I'm just piping all that out to a file. Now, this is a file that I can start giving people, right? Like, this is my public key. Here you go. Whenever you're trying to email me, like, use this public key to do encryption and signing and all that good stuff. Another way to share your key is upload it to a key server. Now, there's a few of these, and they all, I think, sync with each other and stuff like that. Um, the one that I've seen people, or the one that the people that got me in a GPG were using was this MIT server. Uh, Ubuntu's got one, too, that they use. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, a lot of distributions use this to verify their packages when you download new packages. And so stuff like uh, Fedora and, and Ubuntu will have their own key servers for, for hosting and stuff. Now, the key servers are interesting because they're write only. And so once you upload your key to the server, it's there forever. And so my buddy that lost the keys, his keys are on a key server, and they're going to stay there forever, unfortunately for him. Yes? No, because he didn't make a rev revocation certificate. So. When you have a revocation certificate, you want to keep that in a safe place, right? So like on a thumb drive, on a, in a safe or something like that. Um, and when you're ready to revoke the key, then you would, you would push that revocation certificate up to the server. And then the server will correlate the two and then show that key as, as being revoked. Yes. And so once we've got our key, once we've shared it, we can actually start doing some pretty neat stuff. We can start signing our email. This is something that I started doing once I started the GPG because I don't really need anybody else to talk to to sign my own email. And the idea behind this is that people that are then receiving my email, so I talk on a lot of developer mailing lists and stuff like that, they, if they want to, they can take the time to calculate this hash on my message and then calculate the signature and verify that it's fine. If you've got a nice uh, GUI like uh, GPG tools for Mac, which is this tiny picture up here you probably can't see. Um, it'll have like little status bars, right? So if you receive something with the signature, it'll have a nice green check mark there that tells you that the signature was good. If it's got a signature that you don't have the key for, it'll have a little yellow question mark that, you know, hey, this might be good, but maybe not. Um, and then if, if for some reason you get a message with a signature that doesn't match, it'll highlight that in red and tell you, hey, don't trust this email. The signature on this is invalid. Um, GPG tools, the way it does that is it attaches a file when you send your email. So people receiving your email, they'll just see this little attachment, maybe try to double click it and it won't make sense to them. Um, in Thunder, or what am I trying to say? Thunder, Thunderbird, Thunder, the email client with an email. <laughs> Um, it actually does all the signing in plain text, sort of like this. And so um, I think an email does actually give you a little status bars as well. 
but you can then also take this uh, plain text and sort of manually calculate these things yourself. You can also um, start sending your files. And this is something that we do uh, with OpenStack releases, right? Like I'm, I'm making a tarball of this software package and I want to I want to assure you that the tarball that you're downloading is in fact the one that the developers made. And the way we do that is by signing the actual file, right? And so there's there's a few different options for signing. The one that I like to use is this detached signature. And then you give it the name of the file. And so what that'll do is it'll read that entire file as input and then give it the signature for the file as a separate file, right? And then you can put both of those up in your website to download. People would download both the file and the signature and then on their side, run this verify. And then given that they have your public key, then it'll tell them that you know the signature was good. And then you can go ahead with the installation of the software because you know the software hasn't been tampered with. Uh, you could do this too so if you wanted to send um, you know, send pictures to somebody. Um, I don't know what you'd want to sign a, a picture. You probably want to encrypt it. You can also start to encrypt files for yourself. This is something you could do without needing somebody else's key. And the way you could do that is just say encrypt, give it the file name, and then dash R is the, the parameter for the recipient. Normally here you'd put the key ID of the person you're emailing or maybe the email address of the person you're, you're sending this to. But if you email it to yourself, right, like that's, that's effectively encrypting it for yourself later on, you can use your, your private key to decrypt it. And so this is something I do for like uh, Google two-factor codes, you know, the backup codes or whatever, save them in a, te a plain text file, encrypt it with my GBG key, and then I can throw that encrypted file on Dropbox or whatever, I don't care. Nobody that doesn't have, uh, the only person that can decrypt it, presumably is me because only I have the private key. And then decryption, pretty straightforward, just dash dash decrypt. GPG will actually read everything it needs from that GPG file and then it'll output that to the plain text file. Um, you can also start uh, encrypting email. Uh, GPG tools, when you start writing an email and it notices that you have the private or the public key for the person that's receiving it, it'll automatically encrypt it for you. So this terrible picture up here is uh, what it would look like in Gmail, right? Like this is an encrypted email I received in Gmail. It's just a bunch of garbage. If I look at it on my email client that has the correct keys to decrypt it, I can actually see it there, the actual message. Over here, the little status tells me that it's signed correctly by that email address I was expecting and that it's also been encrypted. Everybody with me so far? Looking pretty cool? Awesome. Uh, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is the web of trust, right? So I've talked a lot about, you know, exchanging keys and and it's pretty easy to do if you if you can talk to the person or if you know the person, but um, it's very difficult to do if you're trying to email somebody you've never met before and you don't know for a fact, like, which key is theirs. So I mentioned those key servers, the public key servers are right only, but they're open to anybody, right? So if I wanted to send a message to, like, I don't know, George Bush or, or whatever, if I go check on that key server, there's going to be like 65, 70 different keys with that name, right? So how do I know which is the correct file? And so GPG's answer to this is called the web of trust. And sort of the, their definition of trust here is, is really simple. Is when you trust, or in, in GPG, trust is when you sign somebody else's public key. Oh man, that slide is wrong. That's the public key you sign. Um, and it basically means like, hey, I've verified this person claims this who or is who they claim to be, right? And this is why it's important to use your legal name on your user ID for your key. Because usually the way this works is um, you can ask somebody, hey, would you sign my key? Sure, let me see your key. Okay, it says here you're Doug so-and-so. Let me see some government ID or some other kind of proof that, that sort of ties you, the person, to that name that's on the key. And if that's sufficient for me, then I can attach a signature to their public key and then push that up to the key server. And so, um, oh yeah, how to get your key signed. You can get it with friends, coworkers, um, these things called key signing parties. Usually that's a bunch of G GPG people that get together for the sole purpose of verifying each other's IDs and signing each other's keys. That's a really good way to get a, 
a whole bunch of signatures. Um, so the way you sign the key, obviously I already mentioned, first you check their ID, make sure that their name matches whatever their official ID they're presenting to you. Um, if you want to be real thorough, you, sh you should email that email address that's listed on the key to make sure that that's the email address that they can receive email from. Um, and then you just say, you know, GPG, sign key, give it that key ID, and then GPG will go through the process of creating those signatures. And so here's an example of listing the signatures in a key, right? This is the public key for a buddy of mine, Igor, that's running around here somewhere. And you can see here, he's got a public key, 4096 RSA, and that's his name, is Igor. And he's got, I guess his comment is his um, IRC handle or something like that, and he's got his email address there. And then I see a bunch of signatures. Now the signatures are gonna be, you know, each, each SIG entry here. And I can see here that he's got a bunch of signatures from people that I don't know. So those don't really matter to me. Interesting one here is the signature that I myself put on there. And so one cool thing about signing somebody else's key is that because a signature is only valid if the thing hasn't been tampered with, then you can, if you check your own signature at a later date, you know that that key has not been tampered with. Also interesting is, uh, He's got a signature by Tyler. Now I've met Tyler at one of the GBG key signing parties and I know he's a pretty trustworthy guy and I know he's real thorough when he checks for IDs. And so if I didn't personally know Igor, well, I probably wouldn't have signed his thing. But if I, if I saw that Tyler had signed it, then I, I'm more inclined to believe that this key does indeed belong to him. Because I know Tyler, I know Tyler wouldn't just sign anybody's key. And because he signed Igor's key, then I'm, pretty sure that this is indeed Igor's key. You know, so um, verify the signatures, right? So I have all the public keys for all these people. And so when I run the check signatures, it's only gonna show me the signatures for the public keys I collected. The little hash bang here is what tells you that that's a valid signature. Um, one of the features that, that you can activate with this is uh, managing trust, right? And so you can sort of set the threshold of how much you want to trust people. And so if I met somebody at a key signing party, then I, you know, they're at least interested. So maybe I, I trust them marginally, like I can give this people a three. And the way you do that is, you know, you, you say edit key, this person's public key, and then I'll give you a little GPG prompt and there you say trust. And then these are your options. So you just assign them a number. And so what the software can do is automatically like sort of add up these things of like, well, you know, if, if it's a new key that I've never seen before, but it's at least got three signatures from people that I trust, then I'm more inclined to trust that key that I hadn't seen before. Does that all make sense? Lots of nodding, awesome. And then sort of the last thing I wanted to talk on is, uh, this is sort of like an iterative process. Like this is, this is something you gotta continuously do is refresh your keys. And so, you want to get into the habit of, you know, every couple of weeks or maybe every month or so, uh, refresh your keys from the key server. And so what this will do is it'll go out to the key servers and pull down any new signatures that may have been added. It's also important you do this because that's how you would pull down revocation certificates that may tell you that, you know, something's been, something's been revoked and stuff like that. And uh, that's all I have. I'll distract you guys with the relevant XKCD so you don't ask me questions. No, I'm just kidding. You can ask questions. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to sign someone's key. What do you do to ensure that you push that back up to the key server? So a lot of people recommend that you ask the person how they want to receive your signature. Some people are, um, some people don't like having their keys pushed to public key servers, so they might ask you to just email the file after you've signed it. So it's, it's yeah, I, I would ask the person whose key you're signing what their preferred method is, but you could you could always push it up yourself. It's just some some people consider that rude. So if they're cool with that, you push it up, and everyone will maybe press the keys. We'll get your signature. Yep, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Any thoughts on uh, GPG um, and Yosemite? The issues that they... GPG and Yosemite, yeah, so it's a real bummer that GPG tools does not work with Yosemite. Um, I haven't actually kept up with a, with a mailing list to see sort of what they're doing. Um, 
I believe that the, it's only the email client that broke for me anyway. Like the, the command line clients still work. Online too, so I didn't know if, if I was. I mean, I see some, some other people have, but on and off. So I didn't know. If there were any. Yeah. So I haven't had problems with the command line tool, but the the mail plugin did break for me. Right. So um, I'm really hoping that they're working on it. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but um, Thunderbird does work on on Yosemite. So if you you know if you need a backup plan right now, uh, check out Thunderbird. Not currently. Um, so doing crypto on the browser is kind of dangerous, and I couldn't explain to you why because you know my security expert friends are the ones that tell me that. Um, but I did hear a news bit that um, both Google and um, Yahoo are working on some sort of um, encryption scheme for their for their email. And they're um, they're both basing it on GPG, right? Um, also, you know, if if you if the only thing you have is a Gmail account, you can just set up like an IMAP client uh, and just install, you know, just install GPG on your client. But it, it won't plug into Gmail directly. Not necessarily, because it's really easy to fake email, right? And so you could, you know, maybe you could, like, you, without GBG, you couldn't ensure the email was valid to then start doing GBG. Does that make sense? It's like a chicken and egg problem, right? Back. Uh, yeah, so GPGs, you're explaining you know, how it's really good at things like non-repudiation and mm -hmm. privacy, but it's not good or not really that, it's not good for anonymity. So we still have this really hard problem of, we don't know how to send anonymous mm -hmm. email. I was wondering uh, like if you've looked in like to the Mixin networks at all, to help, yeah, like if you use really GPG to, to send anonymous I, you know, I've never, I've never had to send anonymous email via GPD, so no, not, not familiar with that. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know how you'd go about that, but yeah, that's that's definitely um, a problem with GPG, right? Like, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. So another criticism that I hear is like, it's really hard to use, uh, it's tough to manage keys, which I mean. The fact that I have to sit here for 40 minutes to explain how to get into it, like, sort of speaks to that. Um, also, Web of Trust, um, like you mentioned, a lot of people are concerned that it leaks information, right? And so if I go to a key signing party and get a bunch of signatures, like people will know that I was at a key signing party with all these people. And so there's, there's definitely some criticisms to it, too. Cool. Any more questions? No? Awesome. Well, thank you guys. I'll be around. If you, uh, if you have any questions, send me that key signature.